Here we provide a basic introduction to Reed Solomon coding. Reed Solomon coding is very important in wireless communications. For example, in 802.16.2004, it is used as the outer coding for the concatenated code. And an important attribute of Reed Solomon coding is that it can correct for both random errors and bursty errors. A short history for Reed Solomon codes. They were discovered in 1958 by Reed and Solomon at MIT Lincoln Labs. It was slightly modified and published in the SIAM Journal in 1960 by Reed and Solomon. A breakthrough in decoding Reed Solomon codes was achieved in 1967 by Burleycamp. And we have the famous Burleycamp Massey algorithm, which decodes Reed Solomon codes with a complexity of order n squared, where n is the number of uh, coded symbols. The earliest use was by the military with a one-byte error correction code for deep space telecommunications at around 1970. Interesting to note that Voyager 2 used a 255-byte length with a 223-byte information size Reed Solomon code in 1977 that corrected 16-byte errors that was used in Voyager 2. Reed Solomon coding is also used very successfully in CD-ROMs. It is now going to be widely used in WiMAX in 802.16-2004. It is used as the outer code in a concatenated encoding system in which the inner code is a convolutional encoder, usually with a Viterbi decoder. The fact that Reed Solomon codes can correct for bursty errors is very important in wireless communication systems, and also because of the fact that in a concatenated encoding system, the Viterbi decoder if it can't correct for errors, it would create a bursty error in which the outer code, which is a Reed Solomon code, would then correct for the bursty errors, achieving a great improvement in performance in wireless communication systems. The subject of Reed Solomon codes goes back to coding error correction codes in general, and there's a whole area in mathematics in modern algebra that you need quite a deep background on in order to understand error control coding. Uh, there's a great book by Richard Blauert called Theory and Practice of Error Control Codes, published back in 1983. And since we are not going to spend that much time on the rigorous mathematics and the derivations, the idea is to give an introduction, but we will work out examples so you get a good idea of how Reed Solomon coding works. But the areas that we need to talk about deal with Abelian groups and rings and fields. And of course, as we mentioned here, we just can't do justice in a very short tutorial. But here's a direct quote uh, from Blahot, and it says, loosely speaking, an Abelian group is a set in which one can add and subtract. So if you have a set, say a set of elements, and you can define an addition and a subtraction, then that forms an Abelian group. Then a ring is a set in which you can add, subtract, and multiply. So when you add, multiply, multiplication, then you get the ring. And a field is a more powerful algebraic structure that we'll be dealing with, in which it is a set on which you can both add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So we are going to actually use the field of finite elements called a Galois field, and that's the basis of Reed Solomon codes and BCH codes, cyclic codes, etc. Here are some examples of well known fields in which, of course, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are defined. For example, the set of real numbers, the set of complex numbers, and the set of rational numbers. For example, when you take two real numbers and multiply, you also get a real number which is part of the set. The same holds true for complex numbers, for example. Now, these fields have an infinite number of elements. Now, if you deal with a field with a finite number of elements, then you get into Galois fields, due to the French mathematician Galois. So let's take a field with uh, Q elements. And if it exists, it is called a finite field, as opposed to the previous fields, which had an infinite number of elements or infinite fields. A field with a finite number of elements is called a Galois field and is denoted by this label here, GF 
of Q, where Q is a number of elements within the field, and we'll use this quite often. So let's take a simple example of the Galois field for three elements, and the elements are 0, 1, and 2, and we'll define addition and multiplication on the Galois field of three elements. So in the case of addition, we have 0 plus 0 is 0, we have 1 plus 0 is 1, and 2 plus 0 is 2. But let's take a look at the case where we have, for example, 2 plus 2, then we get 1, similar to adding the elements modulo 3, but that is not the case. Actually, in Galois fields, we do addition and multiplication modulo a polynomial. But in this case, it turns out to be the same as modulo 3 addition. The same for multiplication. If we take 2 times 2, we get 4. And that, of course, modulo 3 is 1. Also, if we uh, multiply 1 by 2, we get 2. So here we've defined the addition and multiplication. And we have a Galois field of three elements. A very important Galois field is of two elements, which is 0 and 1, which is the binary elements. And that is very important in our discussion of coding in general. Now here we're discussing the idea of prime polynomial. And in general, if you have a Galois field of Q elements, and you can find a prime polynomial of degree n, then you can construct a Galois field with Q to the n elements, called an extension field. So let's take an example. Let's build a Galois field with four elements, or GF4, and 4 is 2 to the power of 2. So we'll build it from the Galois field for two elements using the prime polynomial P sub x equals x squared plus x plus 1. Now remember that in Galois fields, everything is done modulo the prime polynomial. So the idea is here, how do we find the elements in Galois field with four elements based on the Galois field with two elements, which are corresponding to 0, 1, using the prime polynomial. Notice that the prime polynomial's degree has to match the n over here. So we got q equals 2, and n is equal to 2, so we got 2 to the 2, which is four elements. Now, this might seem a little confusing, but we'll get back to this. But let's for now find the elements of Galois field with four elements. Now, if you have representations for Galois field 4, we have a table over here, and we're going to show both a polynomial notation, a binary notation, an integer notation, and a very importantly, an exponential notation. Now, let's start out with a polynomial notation. Now, our polynomials, let's give you an example. If you have a polynomial x plus 1, then that corresponds to the binary notation 1, 1. So the first binary digit is associated with x to the power of 0, and the second is associated with x to the power of 1. So 1, 1 corresponds to x plus 1. x, in this case, is really x plus 0, so the first element is 0, the coefficient is 0, and the second element is 1. And of course, 1 is 1 and 0 is 0. We have a 0 coefficient for the second element. So we can represent a using a binary notation, or we, we can represent using a powerful polynomial notation. We can also use an integer notation as shown over here, just given the usual weights when we expand these in terms of the powers of 2, so we get 0, 1, 2, 3. We can also express this using a very powerful notation called exponential notation, and we'll use this quite often. So here we basically have uh, 0 is 0, 1 is x to the 0, that makes sense. x is equal to x to the 1, that makes sense. Now, x squared is equivalent to x plus 1 or 1, 1. Now, that comes about because of the prime polynomial. So when, when we get to x squared, then we have to compute that modulo the prime polynomial. And the remainder is x plus 1. So therefore, x squared exponential x squared corresponds to x plus 1. And this way, using the prime polynomial for Galois field of 2, in this case 2 to the 2, we obtain all the elements of Galois field 4. Now we're going to go through many examples 
so a lot of this will sink in some more. Obviously, to get a better idea of all the Earthmen involved in Gawa fields, we refer you to uh, Bahut's books and also textbooks on modern algebra. Now here we're going to make a definition. We're going to define a primitive field element within Galois field Q, which has Q elements, as an element alpha such that every field element except for zero can be expressed as a power of alpha. So what we're saying here is that every Galois field of Q elements has an element alpha which is a primitive element primitive field element in which all the other elements of all the other q minus one elements excluding the zero element can be generated as powers of alpha let's go back to the previous slide if you look over here and notice that for x we basically have all the powers of x and we were able to generate all the elements within the Galois field for Galois field 4 Let's take a look at Galois field 5. So we have five elements in Galois field 5, and let's generate its elements. Well, one way to do that is we got one element, which is equal to 2, which is equal to 2 to the power of 1. The element 4 is equal to 2 to the power of 2. The element 3 is equal to 2 to the power of 3. And how do we get this? Because we have to do modulo 5 in this case. So 2 to the power of 3 is 8. Modulo 5 is equal to 3. And this is because 5 is a prime number. In the case of 2 to the 4, we get 16. 16 modulo 5 is equal to 1. So we were able to generate all the elements 1, 2, 3, 4 as exponential powers of 2. So 2 is a primitive field element for Galois field 5, shown over here then every element is an exponential of alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4. This is a very important example, and this is a very important uh, definition for a primitive field element, and we'll use this quite a bit in the next sections. Going back here, we notice that, as we mentioned, if we can define a prime polynomial of degree n for a Galois field with q elements, then a Galois field with q to the power of n elements can be constructed using the prime polynomial of degree n. This table is the set of prime polynomials over Galois field 2, so for binary 2. So we can then construct Galois fields for any power of 2 given the prime polynomial. For example, we are very interested in Galois field 2 to the 8 or Galois field 256, which is used in uh, 802.16a, for example. And to construct that Galois field for 2 to the 8, we will use the prime polynomial shown over here of degree 8 that is defined for Galois field 2. And an example to come, we'll be dealing with uh, octal symbols. So we have uh, 2 to the 3 defining eight elements, and we'll use this prime polynomial of degree three, shown over here. We've already used the prime polynomial x2 plus x plus one in constructing the Galois field for four, which was equal to two to the two, the degree being two, so the primitive polynomial, the prime polynomial being x squared plus x plus one. That was used in building Galois field four, which is two to the two, and we use that polynomial in order to construct all the elements of the finite field. Now, a very powerful tool in building code words from messages is to use polynomials, and in particular, we want to use the generator polynomial. So here we'll go through an example and hopefully shed some light on how polynomials are used not only to generate code words based on messages, but also to represent messages themselves and code words themselves. And let's take an example here. We have a generator polynomial, which is equal to x3 plus x plus 1. That's a generator polynomial. And we'll take the case where we're dealing with code words that are 7 bits long. Now, the degree of the generator is 3. 
Therefore, and since the generated polynomial is going to be multiplied by the information polynomial to generate the code word and that has degree 7, then the information polynomial is of degree k equal to 7 minus 3, which is equal to 4. So our messages are going to be 4 bits long, and we're going to map them to 7-bit long code words, and we'll do that through the generator polynomial shown over here. So let's take the case where the message is a 4-bit word shown over here, 0101. That can be represented as a polynomial, as x squared plus 1. Notice that for the 0th degree, we got 1. We're missing x, so we put a 0 here. We have a coefficient of 1 for x2, so we have a 1 here. For x3, we have a coefficient of 0, so we have a 0 here. So these two are completely equivalent representations either in terms of the binary number here or in terms of the polynomial. Now the way we encode the message mx using the generator polynomial gx is to simply multiply them. So if you multiply mx times gx we get the code word c sub x. Now remember that mx's degree is equal to 4, gx's degree is equal to 3, so we get the code word with a polynomial of the degree equal to equal to 7, which is as expected, because we're taking 4-bit message codes and mapping them into 7-bit code words. So let's substitute for mx and let's substitute for gx and we do simple polynomial multiplication and we get the polynomial for the code word here. Just multiply these two polynomials just using simple algebraic operations and let's represent this polynomial for the code word in terms of the binary representation. So for the 0th degree we have a coefficient of 1. For the first we have 1. Second we have 1. We're missing the third, 0. We're missing the fourth, 0. We have a coefficient of 1 for 5. And we're missing x to the 6, so the coefficient is 0. So we have a 7-bit code word here and we can represent it either in a polynomial or a binary fashion. So hopefully this simple example will shed some light on how we can represent messages in terms of polynomials, code words in terms of polynomials, and also generate code words based on a generator polynomial. For many examples, refer to this book, uh, Coding Theory of the Essentials. Very nice book. Let's take a look at uh, Galois Field 8 with 8 elements. And 8 is equal to 2 to the 3. So, going back to our table of primitive polynomials, we see that for degree 3, the primitive polynomial is x3 plus x plus 1. So, to construct the elements within Galois field 8, we need to use the primitive polynomial shown over here. So, let's go ahead and construct the elements, all uh, 8 elements within uh, Galois field 8, based on Galois field 2 using the primitive polynomial piece of x. And we'll use the power method and then derive, easily derive the word representation. So if we look at the powers and just consider x, so we got x to the uh, i for the zeroth power, we get 1. For the first power, we get x. For the second power, we get x squared. Notice that x squared's degree is less than the primitive polynomial's degree, so, the, uh, so mod the primitive polynomial, we just get x squared. But x3, we get x3 mod the primitive mod polynomial, then we get the remainder, which is x plus 1, and x4, again, you have to compute it based on the mod the primitive polynomial, and the remainder is x squared plus x, if you go through and compute the remainder. For x5, you get x squared plus x plus 1, and x6, you get x squared plus 1. So just compute the remainder of x4 divided by the primitive polynomial and you get the remainder and that then is used to generate the elements within Galois field of eight elements. Now that we have the polynomial representation we can actually derive the words. So for example let's take this case over here. So the coefficient for x to the power of zero is zero so we get a zero here. Coefficient for x is 1. Coefficient for x squared is 1. So we get 110 for the word. Here we have 
a 1 here, so basically all three coefficients are present, so we got 1, 1, 1, 1. Here we're missing x, so we get 1, 0, 1. So we can represent in terms of the binary formation, so we've generated all the elements within Galois field of 8. We also have a nice representation in terms of the powers and also in terms of polynomials. Now this table is going to be very useful in terms of doing multiplication in Galois field 8. Remember that multiplication and addition have to be done modulo the primitive polynomial. So that might seem to be a lengthy operation, but we'll show you some shortcuts using the exponentials in this table. So let's take the case where we multiply the elements 0, 1, 1 times 1, 0, 0. The first thing we want to do is represent that in terms of uh, polynomials. So 0, 1, 1 is just x plus 1, and 1, 0, 0 is x squared. That is the second power on the other terms of 0. So now we have a representation in terms of polynomials. We multiply these two. We actually multiply the polynomials. Now here we're going to do a, a little trick. Going back to the table here, we see that x plus 1 corresponds to, is equivalent to x to the power of 3. So we can replace x plus 1 with x to the power of 3 and multiply that times x to the power of 2, and we get x to the power of 5. And if we go back to this table, we see that x to the power of 5 is just x squared plus x plus 1. So this is the result. So the multiplication of 0, 1, 1 times 1, 0, 0 modulo px is then equal to this polynomial, which turns out to be equal to 1, 1, 1 as the word. Using this table and the exponentials and the polynomials, we can easily do multiplications for Galois field of 8, with 8 elements. Here we have a table, which is the same table as we had before, shown over here. But now we're showing the exponentials in terms of the primitive element alpha. So we have alpha, alpha squared, and so forth. Also notice that alpha 0 is equal to 1, as is alpha to the power of 7. And we also represent them in terms of the polynomial using z. And we'll use z for uh, a good reason, as we'll show later. Now, for these polynomials in z, all the coefficients to the polynomial are binary, zeros or ones. And this table for Galois field 8 is all generated with respect to the primitive polynomial, p sub z equals to z3, z to the power of 3, plus z plus 1, which we obtain from the table of primitive polynomials for Galois field 2 and the various degrees. With this background, now we're ready to actually get into read Solomon codes. And in particular, we're going to define the generator polynomial for reed Solomon codes. Now, reed Solomon codes are a subset of BCH codes, and we are just going to just jump ahead and go through an example of a reed Solomon code using octal arithmetic. But in general, most of the things that we say here apply to, without any loss, to the generation of reed Solomon codes based on the reed Solomon uh, generate a polynomial, as we'll show here. So an important uh, part of reed Solomon codes is that their generator polynomial has, for example, as shown over here, two t zeros. So we have two t zeros for the generator polynomial, so we can express the generator polynomial as follows, with, with each zero being alpha to the j zero, for example where j0 is a constant, and we have two t zeros. So this is an important characteristic of reed Solomon codes is that the generator polynomial is expressed in this fashion. This plays a big role in the decoding of reed Solomon codes and also in giving the reed Solomon codes the properties that for correcting errors and bursty errors, both random and bursty errors. So let's take a look at uh, Galois field 8. So with 8 elements, which is uh, Galois field 2 to the 3, the elements are the octal numbers. So all of them mod 8. So that defines the elements within Galois field 8. And we've already uh, dealt with it. We have examples of all the elements being generated using the primitive polynomial. 
And the octal is nice because, because we have basically uh, three bit symbols that we are going to encode, transmit, and then uh, we'll have errors in each uh, three bit symbols and we'll correct them at the receiver. So let's take an example where we said J0 equals to 4 and T equals to 2. So then the generator polynomial becomes this expression over here. And you'll notice that we have four zeros corresponding to 2T. So if T is equal to 2, we, we have twice that many zeros. And the zeros are uh, alpha to the power of 0, alpha to the power of 6, alpha to the power of 5, and alpha to the power of 4. So here we have a generator polynomial for Galois field 8 for Reed Solomon codes. In Reed Solomon codes, the size of the code word is equal to 2 to the 3, in this case, minus 1 or 7. That is always going to be the case. So for Galois field 256, then the, the size of the code word in terms of elements is equal to 256 minus 1 in that case which is 255. In our case here, we're dealing with Galois field with 8, so n is equal to 7, which is 2 to the 3 minus 1. So the code word consists of 7 octal numbers. The generator polynomial is specified with t equals to 2. Now since the generator polynomial with t equals 2 has a degree of 2t, then if we take the information, the message, and multiply times a generator a polynomial with a degree n equals to 7 corresponding to code words that are 7 octal digits long. Therefore, k equals n minus 2t. So this is very important. So what defines k, the number of elements within the information, is actually n and t. So once we know n and t, we then figure out what k is which is always going to be, in the case of reed Solomon codes, equal to n minus 2t, which in our case becomes 7 minus 4, because t is equal to 2, so is equal to 3, so our messages are 3 octal numbers long, and when we encode them using reed Solomon code, they map into code words, which are 7 octal digits long, and as we'll point out, we can actually correct two errors up to two octal digits. So we can correct errors up to two octal digits in the transmission and reception of the coded words through a noisy channel. So let's review again. So we're dealing with Galois field 8. In Reed Solomon, the number of elements within the code is equal to 2 to the 3 minus 1 or 7. If we had a Galois field 2 to the 8, then it'll be equal to 2 to the 8, which is 256 minus 1, or 255. So in that case, it'll be 255 bytes long. So the code would contain 255 bytes. In the case of Galois field 8, then it will contain 7 octal digits. Next, we have associated with the reed Solomon code the generator polynomial, which will have 2t zeros. And therefore, the number of elements within the information is equal to n minus 2t. In our case, n is equal to 7, t is equal to 2. So we get that the size of the information is k equals to 7 minus 4 equals to 3 octal numbers. So we take 3 octal numbers representing information. Using the generator polynomial, map those into 7 octal digits uh, for the coded information to read Solomon coded information. All right, so here we have our generator polynomial, and it expressed in terms of the zeros. So here we actually explicitly show the zeros. We have four zeros, which are equal to the alpha to the power of zero, alpha to the power of six, etc. Recall that the powers of alpha are related to the polynomials, as shown over here, and they're also related to the binary representations via the polynomials. So let's go ahead and multiply through, and this will be a labor-intensive operation in order to come up with the, the compact formula for the generator polynomial. Once we have the generator polynomial, then given three information, octal information symbols, then we'll be able to use the generator polynomial in order to generate the actual coded, seven coded 
symbols for transmission using Reed Solomon. So before we do that, we have to actually go through and multiply through and generate uh, an expression for g sub x. And this is going to be a great exercise in order to get an idea how these uh, exponential representations work and how the polynomials work, etc. So bear with me while we go through this operation. Essentially, if we multiply through, we get gx equals to this expression over here, where once you multiply everything through, we've collected all the terms associated with the various powers of x, as shown over here. And this is very important. So now we have x to the power of 4 uh, minus the coefficient for x to the 3 all the way down to the constant alpha to the 15th. Now this is the polynomial representation of the generator function based on the expression here. So how do we simplify this? So let's take a look at the coefficients for g sub x and the idea is to simplify the expressions here. We need to simplify this expression and show g sub x in terms of the polynomial z for each coefficient corresponding to a power of x. So let's take a look at the term alpha 15. So for the x0 coefficient, alpha to the power of 15 can be written using common bases as alpha to the 7 times alpha to the 7 times alpha. Alpha to the 7 is equal to 1, and alpha itself is equal to z. We see over here alpha is equal to z, so we can replace alpha with a polynomial z. For the x coefficient, we have here the expression for the coefficient for x, which we repeat over here. And let's do a little trick here. We'll just factor out alpha 6. Then we just get this term over here. We get alpha to the power of 3 times the expression here, which we get alpha 3 plus alpha 9. And then we go back to our nice table and substitute for the various powers of alpha in terms of the polynomial z. So just go back to this table over here and substitute for the exponentials of alpha in terms of the polynomials. And if we do that, we get this expression here. And now notice that 1 plus 1 is 0. Z plus 0 is 0, because if you factor out Z, you get Z times 1 plus 1, and 1 plus 1 is 0. Again, we're doing binary modulo 2 arithmetic addition. The Z squared cancel out for the same reason. And once we simplify this whole thing, we just get that it's equal to Z plus Z squared. Now, here's another trick we'll use. Instead of representing alpha 6 in terms of polynomial multiplying through the polynomials, we can go back to the table and look what exponential corresponds to z plus z squared. So z squared plus z is equal to alpha 4. So if we substitute, we get uh, alpha 4, common base, add them up, you get alpha to the 10, which because alpha to the 7 is equal to 1 could be written as alpha to the 3. Go back to the table, and the alpha to the 3 is equal to z plus 1. So we get that it's equal to z plus 1. So this complex expression boiled down to a simple polynomial representation for the coefficient for x. We can go back and look at the coefficients for x squared. And we get the expression here. If we multiply through, we get this expression. Again, we can factor out alpha to the 4. We get this expression, substitute the various polynomials for the powers of alpha, add them up, and simplify. Again, we get that the simplification results in a polynomial z to the squared. That corresponds to alpha squared. This becomes alpha 6. Go back to the table. Alpha to the 6 is equal to z squared plus 1. So this whole number of terms just reduced to z squared plus 1. So that's the coefficient corresponding to x squared. In a similar manner, you can look at the coefficient corresponding to the x to the power of 3, substitute the polynomials, simplify, and you get 1 plus z squared. So this is the result we were looking for. Now we have a nice compact expression for the generator polynomial in terms of the polynomials, the binary polynomials in terms of z, and of course the powers of x. So we have a nice compact expression for the generator polynomial for uh, reed Solomon coding using... Galois field 8 or 2 to the 3 are basically octal elements. If we go back to the table, we can substitute, we can actually use the powers of alpha also 
in lieu of the polynomial representation. So we can also, these two are basically equivalent to each other. Sometimes it's more convenient to use g sub x in terms of the exponentials of the element alpha. So let's go ahead and take a octal sequence, which we show over here, which is basically 110, 001, and 011, and using the generator polynomial shown over here, we want to encode those three octal numbers into seven octal numbers representing reed solomon coding. And t in this case is equal to two, so we can correct up to two octal symbols at the receiver using reed solomon coding. So that's the idea. So here we basically have three octal elements. We're going to encode them into seven octal elements, but, but in this case we're actually going to show how to compute the code words based on the generator polynomial for reed solomon codes. Also, we can represent the numbers either in binary form or in octal form as shown over here, modulo 8. So we have the three octal elements. Let's express those in terms of a polynomial. Since we have three, we'll have uh, our largest degree would be two. The octal element associated with the second degree is z squared plus z which corresponds to 110 here. Again, the 1 for z squared, the 1 for z, and 0 because uh, we have z plus 0 over here. The coefficient for x is just 1, and the coefficient for x to the 0 is 0, 1, 1, which corresponds to z plus 1. So basically, we have a nice compact way of expressing the message in terms of a polynomial, information polynomial shown over here. We can also go back and use the table and express the polynomial in terms of the powers of alpha, a very compact form shown over here. Now the idea is to then use the generator polynomial and the information polynomial to generate the code word for reed solomon coder. So the non-systematic code word polynomial is designated as C sub x, and we're going to generate that using the generator polynomial that we derived earlier. So we basically get that c sub x is equal to the information polynomial times the generator polynomial. So let's take a substitute for the information polynomial we have over here, basically this expression over here, and times the generator polynomial, which we derived earlier, shown over here. So here's the expression for the generator polynomial. So we multiply them through, collect the terms for the various exponentials of x, Notice that the degree of the polynomial is maximum is equal to 6 in this case. We have that the code word is 7 octal digits long, and we've expressed it in terms of the polynomial. So now we need to derive what the actual octal digits are. So if we take a close look at this polynomial, uh, let's start out with the, uh, the first symbol, which corresponds to the uh, x to the power of 0, which is alpha to the 4. If we take a look at alpha to the 4, we can go back and look at the polynomial, we see that uh, for alpha 4, the polynomial representation is z squared plus z, which corresponds to, in the case of octal again, recall that we're dealing with uh, octal, corresponds to 110. So alpha 4 corresponds to 110. The second octal digit corresponds to the coefficient for x, and it's alpha 5. Let's take a look at what that is. So alpha 5 is z squared plus z plus 1, so we got 1, 1, 1, which is shown over here. The coefficient for x2 is 0 and x3 is 0, so those octal digits are equal to 0, 0. And we get for x4, we get alpha 6. Go back to the table again. Alpha 6 is z squared plus 1. That's 1, 0, because we're missing z, plus 1. So it's 1, 0, 1. Oh, shown over here. So if we complete that, we see that we can, based on the polynomial for the code word c sub x, we can actually extract the seven octal digits that form the reed solomon code, shown over here. And if we express them in terms of octal numbers, we get the seven octal digits shown over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now the original message, which is incorporated into i sub x, was 613 shown over here, 613. So the three octal digits 
were mapped into seven octal digits for the code word. Recall n equals 7 and k was equal to 3. So we show that here n was 7, k was equal to 3, and t was equal to 2. 2t was equal to 7 minus 3. So 7 minus 3 was equal to 2t, then t was equal to 2. The number of octal digits we can correct at the receiver is equal to two digits. So this is a very nice example that shows uh, how to obtain the code word for read settlement coding, in this case using octal uh, from the information, the octal digits from the, that form the information, and we went through the process of generating the expression, the compact expression for the, for the generator polynomial. We multiply that times the expression for the information polynomial, and we get the polynomial for the code word, which corresponds to the actual oct coded octal digits. Now, in this part, we want to show, and that we can correct for t errors, where, again, t is a key parameter in Reed-Solomon code. We specify n, and we specify t. Then the information bits k equals n minus 2t. So to begin with, let's take a look at the generator polynomial for reed solomon codes. The generator polynomial has r zeros, where r is equals to 2t. We, go after, we actually have 2t zeros. And let's designate those uh, zeros as gamma 1 through gamma r. So g of gamma j is equal to 0 for j equals 1 through r, where r is the number of zeros, which corresponds to 2t in this case. We're going to let CX designate the code word polynomial, and E of X is the error polynomial. So as we transmit CX to the channel, at the receiver we get V of X, which contains an error polynomial. So the receiver receives a number of elements. For example, in our case, uh, for example, it was seven octal digits, but they've been corrupted by the channel, so they have errors. And the idea is to correct for those errors at the receiver using reed solomon decoding process. And using polynomial notation is very compact and useful in this case. So one thing we can do is, very interestingly, is if we take the roots of g sub x, which were the elements gamma sub j, and we had r roots, so if we plug in a root gamma j into the expression here for the received corrupted code word, then we get, since these are polynomials, we just evaluate them for the zeros of the generator polynomial, in this case gamma j, and we get this expression here. Now by definition, c sub x is equal to g sub x times i sub x, where i sub x is actually the information and g sub x is the polynomial generator polynomial, and since gamma j is a zero of the generator polynomial, then c sub gamma j is equal to zero. Again, c sub x equals gx times i sub x. So for zero of the generator polynomial, g sub x is zero, so this term drops out, and we get the expression that if we evaluate the received corrupted code words using the element which corresponds to the zero of the generator function, then it's equal to this expression here. The error polynomial can be written out in terms of coefficients e sub i and x sub i, which is in terms of the polynomial, but we were replacing x by the zeros of the generator polynomial, so basically we have this expression here for the evaluation of the received code word corrupted through the channel using a zero of the generator polynomial. So we get this expression here. And this goes over i equals 0 to n minus 1 because the size of the received code word is actually n corresponding to the actual transmitted code word. Now the idea is that we need to solve this set of equations in order to find the error polynomial. And then if we find the error polynomial, then we can correct the errors because that corresponds to the error pattern. So let's express the error polynomial as follows, and in this case, we'll just consider the case where we have actually v number of errors. So there are v number of errors, so we're excluding cases where there wasn't any error, just cases where there are errors. So we have v of those. So we have basically v terms shown over here. Each term 
the power of x shows where that error occurred and e to the j one in this case shows what the error was so we can show the error polynomial very compactly corresponding to v errors so the error locations are shown by the indexes j sub 1 through j sub v and we have v errors and also we have the actual values of the errors now to get a more compact expression we can actually define uh, y sub l in terms of the actual values of the error for l equals 1 through v the number of errors but, and also x of l in terms of gamma sub l of j once we substitute uh, in the case which we're going to do for example x we substitute for x the as zero of the generator polynomial then we get x of l this expression here for various values of l now if we take s of j equals to v of gamma j then basically we're taking the received corrupted code word and evaluating it with a the jth zero of the gener generator polynomial that we have r of those then we get the number s of j which is equal to this expression here because recall that v of gamma j was actually equal to e of gamma j and then we make the substitutions for y sub l and x of l in order to come up with this very compact expression instead of the expression here which we'd actually substitute for x gamma sub j and we'll get this expression here we're going to get this expression here now the y the y sub l's uh, correspond to the error values and the x of l's corresponding to the position of the errors so again let's emphasize that v is the number of errors now if v is less than or equal to t and greater than zero and less than or equal to t then we have an interesting uh, situation again here we're re-emphasizing the definitions of y sub l where y sub l corresponds to unknown error values x of l corresponds to unknown error locations so we have the unknowns shown over here take the case where r is equal to 2t which is the case because the generator polynomial reach settlement has 2t zero so r equals to 2t so if r is equal to 2t then we have we evaluate the received corrupted code word 2t times and we get the numbers s of j where j goes from 1 through r or 1 to 2t so we have 2t expressions here now over here we basically consider the case where v is less than t then we have v unknowns in y v unknowns in x and we have 2t expressions and if v is less than t then we have the maximum t unknown y's t unknown x's and we have 2t expressions therefore we can actually solve these expressions for y sub l's and x of l's and if we solve for y sub l's and x of l's we've solved for the value of the error and the position of the error and therefore we can correct the errors so this is at the heart of the reed settlement coding now for this to happen v has to be less than or equal to t otherwise we we have more unknowns than we have expressions so take the case where v is equal to t so we have t unknowns for y t unknowns for x1 you can think of it as having two t unknowns and we have two t expressions corresponding to the evaluation of the received corrupted code word using the two t zeros of the generator polynomial so we have two t expressions with two t unknowns although it is nonlinear we can solve it to obtain the positions of the errors and the actual values of the errors up to t errors this way we can correct up to t errors using reed settlement coding and the errors could be either random or bursty now here we show a nice graph this is from Waller in Linka Bit Corporation San Diego back in 76 that is referenced by Bernard Sklar in this article available on the internet uh, also this picture is available in uh, Sklar's uh, very good book on digital communications fundamentals and applications uh, this plot is for a 32 area MFSK modulation over additive white Gaussian noise and we're plotting the bit error rate versus the EBN0 over here or uh, as you know as you increase the single power then EBN0 increases 
And here the curves basically show that, for example, for t equals 4, in which case uh, we can uh, correct for uh, four symbols, we can correct for four symbols, then we get the probability of error is this curve over here, and compare that with the case where t equals, uh, for example, 2, and we see that we have a performance gain in terms of the bid error rate the versus EBN0 for the case where we correct for four errors versus the case where we correct for two symbol errors. Also for t equals 1, we get a gain of about, uh, for example, 10 to the minus 6, uh, more than a dB gain using uh, more redundancy in the case for t equals to 4 and correct more errors. Now there's some other things happening. For example, you notice that uh, for the case where t equals to 8, the performance is worse than t equals to 4. So that has to do basically with the way the interplay between adding redundancy and increasing bandwidth uh, and the, the actual coding rate, etc. We'll get into that in a minute. But basically we're showing that uh, compared for the case where we correct for one uh, symbol, and where we can correct for four symbols, and even given the extra overhead, the expanded bandwidth, etc., we get uh, quite a bit of gain. Now this family of curves is uh, very interesting, and this is uh, again due to uh, Sklar and a reference uh, both the uh, internet article uh, which he has written on Reed Solomon codes and also the book Digital Communications. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, set of curves. We're plotting basically EBN0 which you can uh, think about in terms of uh, power so the higher the EBN0 is the more power we, we require and this is the EBN0 that is needed to get a performance uh, of a probability of bit error equals to 10 to the minus 5. So in order to get to 10 to the minus 5, this is the EBN0 we need to achieve that quality, 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate. This is versus the coding rate for the reed solomon coding. Now to give you an idea, a coding rate of 1 means that basically we don't add any redundancy at all. So this is the case where we don't actually do any coding at all. And as the coding rate decreases, this means we're adding a lot of redundancy uh, to the code word in terms of the information in order to do uh, error correction at the receiver. Now th this, these curves show a very interesting phenomenon. Let's take the case for added white Gaussian noise which is this curve over here and you'll notice that uh, just to set this thing in perspective uh, this is by the way very nice because it's done for BPSK binary phase shift king. Notice that uh, when the coding rate is equal to 1, meaning that we're not doing any coding at all, then we just have BPSK for added white Gaussian noise. And for a probability of error equals to 10 to the 5, we're basically getting an EBN0 equals to close to 10. Now, as we start adding redundancy, and again, re remember that we're actually increasing the bandwidth requirements, uh, we decrease the required EBN0 to achieve 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate. So at this point here, this shows that with Reed Solomon coding, for example, at around with a code rate of around 0.6, we require much less power than the case where we use no coding at all. So by just adding Reed Solomon coding to BPSK, we're able to reduce by close to 3 dBs the power requirements in order to meet our performance requirements which was 10 to the minus 5. So for example consider a deep space communication link or a satellite link. Basically what this says is if we add read Solomon coding rather than no coding at all we can reduce the power requirements by 3 dB which is very important in uh, deep space communication in order to reduce the power requirement. Now as we decrease the coding rate, which means we add more and more redundancy, we actually start to deteriorate in performance. And that is we need more and more power in order to meet our objective of 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate. And this has to do with the fact that there's a point where when you add more redundancy, you're actually adding more bandwidth requirements and there's a there's a point of diminishing returns. So this is a very interesting uh, curve over here. Uh, now this is very interesting also. 
Let's take a look at this curve over here. This is for Rayleigh fading channels, which we deal with, with a lot in terms of wireless communications. In the case of Rayleigh fading channel, we see that, first of all, we need much more power in order to get the same performance as an additive white Gaussian channel, and that's because of the basically the uh, fading, Rayleigh fading going on. But notice that the point also shifts, the optimum point sort of shifts, which indicates that for a Rayleigh fading channel, we need to add more redundancy in order to get a better performance than in the case of additive white Gaussian noise. Now here we have a Ricean channel. In the case of a Ricean channel, we actually have a strong uh, signal from uh, line of sight. That is, the uh, terminals can actually have a direct line of sight, and that's expressed by K, which is the K factor, in this case 7 dB. So although we have scattering and non-line of sight components, we have a strong line of sight component. In the case of Rayleigh fading channel, it is completely non-line of sight. There is not a, a line of sight to the transmitter. So in the case of a Ricean fading channel, we see that, uh, again, because of the direct path, the amount of power that we require to achieve certain performance is much less than the case of a totally non-line of sight characteristic as we encounter in a Rayleigh fading channel. And again, the uh, point moves a little bit to the left of the Gaussian channel, so we still need more redundancy in order to achieve our performance. So this is a great set of curves uh, due to uh, Sklar uh, in order to understand the performance of reed Seliman in either a additive white Gaussian noise channel or a totally non-line of sight Rayleigh fading channel environment or in the case where you have a component due to line of sight in a Ricean channel. Also note that uh, in the case of an additive white Gaussian noise when we use no coding at all, that is the code rate is equal to one, we're not adding, we're not doing resettlement coding and it's pure binary phase shift keying, that at 10 to the minus five uh, bit error rate, the EBN zero was close to 10. If you go back to this curve over here, which we derived, which we derived in the section on basic digital communications, we have the bit error rate probability for BPSK as a function of EBN zero and for a bitter rate of 10 to the minus 5, we get about 10 dB of uh, EBN0, a value of 10 dB for EBN0, which corresponds to this point over here. So nice uh, correlation between the two results. For more information on the architecture and implementation of uh, read settlement coders and decoders, including issues related to VLSI, uh, see the following reference, Error Controlled Coding for Data Networks by uh, Irvin Reed and uh, Shen. Now, Reed is, the, of course, the original, uh, with Solomon, the original inventors of reed Solomon coding. And this book also has some nice worked examples uh, throughout.